afternoon friends and we welcome you to another session of study circle meeting over to mr ashok pati to give introduction about the resource person of the day thank you, thank you sir and uh, good evening very good evening friends today i have been given a very pleasant task of introducing balaji what more can be a more joyful to introduce a, a good friend of yours and today i am having that joy today i can proudly state that uh, we cherish two generations of uh, friendship among us i intend to take you through what i know about balaji rather than stating what he specializes after all if i'm going to state that it is going to be saying like water is in a fluid state a very simple humble person very happy always i bet you could have never seen him without a smile on his face a fair both physical and naturally by his attitude a person he is one can proudly state that the most of the building complexes and towers in and around chennai have escaped long drawn litigation solely due to the abilities of balaji to settle the dispute he often as an advocate suggests more of settlement rather than going on intricacies of law that has been his habit and his uh, way of uh, practice which is an excellent way to practice as an advocate i was always wondering how he found time for various activities that he does we all know that how he has been moving around in the court a lot of apart from that he has been the associate uh, editor of ctc authoring books including the recent handheld uh, handbook of the law of specific performance and he just told me that uh, he under the new act we all get the old name rent control but still, under the rent act now new act he is going to bring up a new i mean book apart from this he is a faculty in the state of uh, state judicial academy where he lectures on wide range of civil subjects and regularly pens articles touching law and allied subjects in leading dailies like the hindu times of india and new indian express if you think that is all that he has got you have totally underestimated him and you have failed in our judgment he is an ardent fan of cricket and a excellent photographer especially a cricket and travel photographer his photographs are a delight to be seen though i have the i had only a few to uh, had the opportunity of seeing only a few i know there are plenty more but those few uh, photographs have always captured me his photographs taken in the cricket grounds in australia and the and in rajasthan are always in my eyes and i always compare him as a photographer based on the results of those photographs yes i know remember that i have come here only to give a brief introduction of balaji if not i can keep going on and on about balaji though i would like to hear him talk more about his photography his travel and his meeting cricketers but i am today forced by study circle to request him to uh, educate us on the amendment to this specific relief act over to balaji thank you thank you ashok very kind words probably we'll have a separate webinar for photography <laughs> not in the study circle <laughs> sure 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 <laughs> i hope all of you are staying safe and and i really hope we are looking at the end of the lockdown with the pandemic probably bored of all of us and going away on its own i to i should pay tributes to this group of advocates jasho ko chalenge me about six lawyers have come together and uh, as many as 57 lectures and having started late i think they are going at a very hectic pace and very good opportunity for young lawyers especially to learn variety of subjects and especially the nitty gritty of very many subjects new laws are coming in so they have called persons from across fields civil criminal tax bar etc and enlighten the young lawyers who are definitely going to be benefited by these lectures coming to today's subject the law of specific performance or specific relief act as you all know 1963 enactment it has been in force ever since 
fact, if I give you a brief history of the act before going into the amendments, which were in 2018, and analyzing the amendments, especially since young lawyers may be there, they should know what is this act about, why was this act enacted, and what is the scope of the enactment. The 1877 specifically fact was enacted during the pre-independence period. So 1877 specific relief act was the first act which was on the lines of the New York guidelines of 1862, I think. The New York guidelines were the basis on which the 1877 act was promulgated. And after independence, the government felt there was a need to change the law. And 1963 act, 47 of 1963, the act was amended. And most of the provisions of the 1877 Act were retained and minor tinkering was done here and there and the 1963 Act came into force. In fact, if you see, the object, statement of objects and reasons of both the Acts was the same. The 1877 Act as well as the 1963 Act, the statement of objects and reasons was to amend and consolidate, consolidate the law relating to certain kinds of specific relief. So the act itself, by its own definition in the objects and reasons, limits its application to certain kinds of specific relief. So it cannot be an exhaustive act on specific relief. You may ask me what is specific relief? As the name of the act itself suggests, it's a relief in specie. When you want a specific relief from the court, you can get it under these the provisions of the Specific Relief Act of 1963. There are different kinds of rights. There are legal rights, moral rights, social rights, religious rights. Only the legal rights can be enforced before a court of law. Maybe moral rules may be enforced in the petition, but not under the civil procedure court invoking the provisions of the Specific Relief Act. So legal right is a must. Where does a legal right flow from? The source of a legal right. Here, contract. The Indian Contract Act can be said to be the parent enactment for the Specific Relief Act of 1963. In fact, if you go back to 1877, if you notice the Indian Contract Act was promulgated in 1872. So within five years, the Specific Relief Act was enacted by the government during the pre-independence period itself. So what was the necessity for bringing in such an enactment called the Specific Relief Act? See, if you see under the Contract Act, the award of damages was primary. The, the rule, rule was give damages. Therefore, where courts felt that it is not sufficient to compensate a person who is aggrieved by a breach of contract, he must also get relief of what he missed under the contract. That is how the courts in England formulated doctrines of equity and the principles of doctrines of equity, the principles enunciated by the English courts are the basis for the Specific Relief Act. In fact, in India, the equitable principles have been codified under the Specific Relief Act. So therefore, 1963 Act as we all know, it is, as I told you, it is catering to certain kinds of reliefs. So what is the structure of the Act? You see, the Act consists of about eight chapters. The first chapter, the first sections one to four are preliminary sections. Interestingly, if you note, the definition clause, unlike various other enactments, is very small. We normally see section two, which is the definition clause in any statute. It will run from 2A to 2Z. 2Z may not be enough. It will start with ZA, ZB, ZC. But here, it covers only four definitions. An obligation, a trust, trustee, and yeah, one more definition of settlement. settlement. These are the four terms which are defined under the specific relief act, section 2. 2E is very important. Section 2E says the, term, the terms and phrases which are used in this act but not defined will have the same definition which has been given to such words or phrases under the Indian Contract Act. So therefore, even 
at the very beginning, the legislature has recognized that the specific relief act is more or less a follow up to the Indian Contract Act. The Indian Contract Act, we all know, deals with more of damages in case of breach of contract. But how to give a specific relief, a relief in species, otherwise you can say exact fulfillment of the right which is breached. This is what is called specific relief. What are the kinds of specific relief? Rights can be classified as positive and negative as you all know. So suppose I have an agreement with Ashok and I am the owner of the property. Ashok wants to purchase the property from me. I go back on my promise. I refuse to enter in, I refuse to execute a sale deed in his favor. So he goes to court and seeks for a positive relief of specific performance. So specific performance is a positive relief. It is a specific relief. A contract for a contract is enforced for purposes of rescission or rectification or cancellation. All these are positive because you seek for a positive remedy from the court. Negative reliefs are injunctions. So injunctions again, there are positive injunctions and negative injunctions. Positive injunctions, as you all know, are mandatory injunctions. Where you want a person to do something, act something, which he has omitted to do. These are called positive injunctions, otherwise mandatory injunctions under the Physical Relief Act. There are negative reliefs. You have to restrain somebody from selling. Restrain somebody from enjoying the use of drugs. So these are negative reliefs which are also specific reliefs. So therefore, it is a bundle of positive and negative reliefs which come together as specific reliefs. And why is it called certain kind? Why do they say certain kinds of specific relief? It is not exhaustive. In fact, even in 1972, in Hungerford case, the Supreme Court said it is not an exhaustive enactment. It deals only with certain kinds of specific reliefs. Therefore, what are the other reliefs which the Act does not cover? For example, even under the Criminal Procedure Code, if you see under Section 145, a person who has been deprived of his property can seek for recovery of possession and be put back into possession. So this is again a specific relief. Let us take a case of a partnership where accounts, partnership deed, accounts are sought to be put forth before the court or in cases of trademark, patent law, copyright law, there are scope, there are provisions for grant of injunction. These are all specific reliefs which will not come within the gamut of the Specific Relief Act. So the Specific Relief Act therefore deals with mobile and removal properties which are capable of being enforced specifically. And as I said, it is more or less a follow-up and sister, uh, not even a sister, it can be probably the second generation. The Contract Act is the outsource, the fountainhead of the source of the specific relief act is the contract act because fundamentally for the specific relief act to apply there must be a contract in place so therefore without the contract act the specific relief act cannot exist so it, it is dependent on the indian contract act these are the provisions which specific relief act as i told you consists of mainly three chapters the first chapter the first eight chapters the first section the three parts i would say three parts the first part is the preliminary section which deals with sections 1 to 4 which defines what is the, the different terms and as I told you section 2, section 3, section 4 are preliminary sections. Then we, they come with specific property. How to get delivery of specific property, movable and immovable. That is the sections A6, 6 to 8. Then you have section 9 to 25 is specific performance of contracts. This is the backbone of the specific relief act. Sections 9 to 25. Then we have rectifications, rescission, cancellation. Before we move, move on to the injunctions and declarations. So suits for declaration, suits for injunctions are also varieties of specific relief only. So these are the various kinds of specific reliefs which are covered under the Specific Relief Act. Now, coming to the amendment. Because today's topic is, I am going to highlight the effect of the amendment. What is the scope of the Amendment Act of 2018? So as you all know, the economic development in the country has seen a rapid growth, especially after 2000. So the government felt that the Act was not in line, in tune with the changing economic trends. 
the government was losing out on international contracts infrastructure contracts because the investors and foreign companies were afraid that they will get embroiled in litigation the cases go on for years together no relief in end in sight therefore these were factors which were dissuading prospective investors nris from investing in the country therefore they appointed an expert committee the central government appointed an expert committee which came out with the report in 2016 they suggested very many changes all the changes have not been taken into the amendment act some of the sections alone some of the suggestions of the expert committee alone have been taken into consideration and the act has been amended by the amendment act 18 of 2018 it received the assent of the president of india on the 1st of august 2018 and it has come into force on 31 10 so therefore the new amended provisions have come into effect in force as on 31 10 2018 this is the amendment act so which are the areas which have been amended by the amendment act very few sections have been actually amended but the nature of amendments are really very substantive which is going to change the way the courts are going to interpret the very enactment itself therefore even if the amendments are very minimal in quantity the quality of amendments which have been brought about are very very serious and are going to have a great impact on the way contracts are going to be treated contracts are going to be entered into how breach is going to be viewed all these are going to be very major factors in the years to come so section 6 is the first section which has been amended by the amendment act 18 of 2018 section 6 as you may know gives a right to a person to seek recovery of possession to be put back in possession where he has been dispossessed without the due process of law and without his consent so section 6 originally entitled a person who was dispossessed to seek remedy under section 6 it is a very speedy remedy because once you make an application within 6 months the limitation is only 6 months within 6 months from the date of the dispossession if you file an application or a suit under section 6 of the specific relief act it has to be decided there is no appeal provided against the finding or the order rendered in an application under section 6 therefore it is a speedy remedy the other advantage is your question of title will not be gone into in section 6 so a person even a tenant who does not have title to the property a licensee who has no right in the property can approach the court if he is dispossessed by even the even by his own landlord or by somebody else or a third party and seek recovery of possession this is the scheme of section 6 so what the amendment has done is it has introduced an application can be made to the court by a person who has been dispossessed or a person through whom the person is claiming under i will give you a very small example which would explain the position the amendment very clearly so a lets out the property to b a is the landlord b is the tenant b has been dispossessed by c c is a neighbor c for whatever reason he dispossesses b probably he says case of encroachment by a into his property but he in the process he dispossesses b so now under the old act before the amendment the tenant b has the right to seek for recovery of possession but now after the amendment even a under whom b claims right of possession can approach the court and seek for recovery of possession under section 6 so this is a very substantial amendment so it confers a right on a person under whom the person who lost possession also to claim approach the court and seek for recovery of possession here there is a rider where the government has dispossessed the person the section will not apply so this is an exception and secondly a person who is the lawful owner can establish his title rehearse the right given under section 6 to the aggrieved party who lost possession you can establish your right and title and sustain your possession this is section 6 then section 10 is the next amendment the amendment into section 10 is very substantial you see the old section 
the section read specific performance of see most in fact you must remember here that the amendment that 18 of 2018 has focused more on specific performance of contracts not on declarations not on suits for injunctions not on other sections which do not deal with specific performance of contracts but focus is only on specific performance of contracts sections 9 to 25 so accepting the amendment to section 6 and section 40 which i will take you a little later all the other amendments or which are very substantial in nature are only with regard to the chapter on specific performance of contracts so section 10 if you see the old section 10 it read cases in which specific performance of contract is enforceable so therefore this heading itself is now changed and replaced with specific performance in respect of contracts so what the old section 10 did was it said except as provided in the chapter specific performance of a contract may in the discretion of the court be enforced so the importance was on may in the discretion of the court therefore it was not mandatory for the court to grant specific performance a discretion was vested in the court to grant specific performance this is the opening words of section 10 prior to amendment but now what the section now reads is specific performance in respect of contracts specific performance of a contract shall be enforced by the court so may in the discretion is now gone shall be enforced by the court subject to provisions contained in subsections 2 of section 11 section 14 and section 16 so these are the only three exceptions where specific performance of a contract cannot be granted in all other cases now it is mandatory for the court to grant specific performance of a contract so this is a very serious amendment which is going to change the way courts are required to look at contracts the way have they have to interpret breach of contract and the way they have to mold their relief because now the word may in its discretion is gone the word used now is shall so it is now mandatory obligatory for the court to grant a decree for specific performance after the amendment the only three exceptions which are provided as i told you is of section 2 to section 11 section 14 and section 16 the third amendment is section 11 the next amendment was made to section 11 here again the words may in the discretion of the court has been removed and replaced with shall section 11 as you may be aware deals with specific performance in respect of trust matters where an act is agreed to be done in performance of a trust wholly and there is a breach section 11 will come into play the words may in the discretion is now removed and the word shall has been substituted therefore here again like section 10 it is no obligatory for the court to grant specific performance if you remember we saw the exception section 11 subsection 2 subsection 2 says a contract made by a trustee in excess of his powers or in breach of trust cannot be specifically enforced so this is the first exception to section 10 where a contract is made by a trustee representing a trust but he exceeds his powers abuses his powers or the act he commits is, is in breach of the trust that cannot be specifically enforced because as you all know trust court is the custodian of the trust trust property also therefore extra caution is taken in such matters where a person cannot swallow the trust property he cannot make unlawful enrichment at the expense of the trust therefore section 112 is a carved out exception section 12 there is no amendment section 12 for just for highlighting it is part performance of a contract in which cases performance can be made in part there is an agreement normal rule is the agreement has to be enforced in in its, in its entirety but there are exceptions in section 12 where performance can be in part part performance and agreement is contemplated in section 12 the next amendment is section 14 which again as you remember it is an exception to section 10 section 14 before the amendment read like this the heading itself was contracts not specifically enforceable the following contracts namely so there are four instances set out 
in old section 14. These are the contracts which cannot be specifically enforced. Therefore, these were exceptions where the court cannot, under any figment of imagination or any power available to it, grant specific performance. There were four clauses. That has been slightly tinkered with by the amendment. 14 clause A has been replaced. The old 14A said a contract for non performance of which compensation is an adequate relief. So, where compensation can be adequately granted and it is a relief which will make good the non performance, then court cannot grant specific performance was the old law. That has been totally now taken away in line with the scope and the object of the amendment to make performance the rule and damages the exception. So that is the main object. The letter and spirit of the amendment, if you ask me, is reversing. The original rule was damages is the rule, specific performance is the exception. But today, after the amendment, the position is now changed and performance is the rule. Damages has taken a back seat to the exception. So 14A, therefore, in line with the objects of the amendment, the 14A has been totally removed. A new 14A has been inserted where it says a contract where a party to the contract has obtained substituted performance of a contract in accordance with provisions of section 20 is not enforceable. So section 20 is again an amended provision which I will come to you, come to it a little later. But this is one of the amendments because section 20 has been substituted with the new section 20. 14A does away with adequate compensation. It is irrelevant now whether compensation is going to adequately can be adequately give relief to the party or not. Irrespective of that, specific performance is the rule. The other provisions in 14 are not modified, are not majorly touched because those are contracts where a contract in its nature determinable, a contract which is dependent on the personal qualifications of the parties, which court cannot enforce, or Contracts where the court cannot continuously supervise. Minute details are there. The court cannot supervise. All these are exceptions of contracts where specific performance cannot be granted. So 14A is the most important amendment where substituted performance, if obtained under section 20, court cannot grant specific performance is the amendment. The old 14A where non-performance of which compensation adequate relief is being taken away. A new 14A has been inserted. Now, irrespective of the powers available to the court under the Code of Civil Procedure, special rights, special powers have been conferred on the court under Section 14A, a power to engage experts. So if the court trying a suit for specific performance feels that on any special technical issue, the court needs the expert guidance of an expert person or an engineer, maybe the court can take the guidance, it can call for information. It can examine the expert person before the court. It can also order payment of compensation or cost to the person because he is going to sacrifice his valuable official type, professional time, come to court and be on official other duty. Therefore, these are the powers under 14A. This is notwithstanding the powers of the civil court under the Code of Civil Procedure. So 14A is a new, 14 capital A is a new introduction by the amendment act. 15 is not amended. 15, in fact, there's a minor addition to section 15. 15, as you know, is deals with it is a section which says who are the persons who can obtain specific performance. It categorizes, lists out the persons who may obtain a specific performance of a contract. This is section 15, where there is a new insertion FA. 15 FA includes a limited liability partnership which had originally entered into a contract. And subsequently has become, had been amalgamated with an, another limited liability partnership. Then the original contract, which was entered into by the then existing LLP, can be enforced by the newly constituted LLP after amalgamation. So this is the only addition in section 15. Section 16 is the most debated section in the entire specific relief act, as you all know. Section 16 is personal bar to relief. Specific performance of a contract cannot be enforced in favor of a person. See, we saw section 14. Section 14 says 
where specific performance of a contract cannot be given. Here, section 16 talks about the person who seeks specific performance, not about the contract. Section 16 deals with the person, his entitlement to seek specific performance of a contract. So specific performance of a contract cannot be enforced in favor of a person. Now, the, after the amendment, the position is who has obtained specific substituted performance of a contract in the section 20. So if a person has obtained substituted performance of a contract, he is not entitled to seek specific performance under section 16 or any other provision under the act. So what was section 16 prior to the amendment? You see section 16 prior to the amendment, A, A was not there. Specific performance of contract cannot be enforced. A person in favor of a person who has become incapable of performing or violates any essential term of the contract that on his part remains to be per per performed or acts in fraud of the contract or willfully acts at variance with or in subversion of the relation intended to be established by the contract. So here the person discredits himself by an act or omission. He breaches or violates the essential terms of the contract. Then he is disentitled to seek specific performance of the contract. 16C is very important. 16C again is amended. If you see originally, section 16C read, a person who fails to aver and prove that he has performed and has always been ready and willing to perform the essential terms of the contract which are to be performed by him other than terms of performance which have been prevented or waived by the defendant. So earlier the act said before the amendment, aver and plead, aver and prove. Now the word aver is removed by the amendment and the word now is who fails to prove. So a person who fails to prove that he has performed or has been ready and willing to perform the contract are to be performed, then he is disentitled from seeking specific performance. So you will see in all the planes in the suit for specific performance, as lawyers, we ensure that at more than one place, we employ the phraseology ready and willing. The plaintiff has always been ready and willing to perform his part of the contract. It is only the defendant who has not come forward, the defendant who has neglected or breached his duty, his obligation. So these are the usual phrases which we employ in any suit for specific performance. Now, a question is can be posed by the amendment, by removing the words aware, does the requirement to plead readiness and willingness vanish? Or do you still have to plead readiness and willingness? Because now the section says, the person who fails to prove, aware and prove is removed. So here if you, as practicing lawyers, we all know the difficulties of the, I would say the litigants as well as the lawyers and the the questions posed before the court. So without a pleading, can 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 there be proof? Can there be evidence? It is a very fundamental law that without pleading, especially in a civil suit, without pleading, there can be no proof, no evidence letter. So the, your plea will fail. So therefore, straight away, I would say, even though the words "ever failed to ever" has been removed you still have to plead that you have been ready and willing or you have already performed your part of the contract. What remains is only the defendant's obligations. So this has to be pleaded and proved. Even though the section now does not mandate you to aver, you still have to plead and prove. Because otherwise without pleading, you are you cannot prove the evidence that will stare in your face. Therefore, why why then why what is the intention of the legislature in removing the words aver? In fact, if you had seen very number of judgments, the Supreme Court, our High Court, and various other High Courts have time and again said you need not exactly reproduce the words employed in Section 16C. You must only indicate that as a plaintiff, you have been ready and willing, you have performed all your obligations, nothing remains to be done at your end. So this can be worded in any, any way which you want. Still, if you can gather from the plaintiff your intention of readiness and willingness, courts have always agreed with the plaintiff's case. But now with the removal of the words ever, straight away there is a leverage given to the plaintiff in, and probably authorizing him or enabling the plaintiff to plead in whatever manner he wants. There is no specific form for the appendix need not be followed. 
you we all know there is an appendix in the cpc where specific suits suits for market suit for redemption suit for partnership dissolution suits for specific performance there 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 are forms which you are bound to follow so now that there is a failure to aver is removed after the amendment you need not adhere to the strict rigor of the appendix or the forms prescribed in the cpc so that is the only intention we should gather from the omission of the words fail to aver you still have to prove so therefore the proof aspect is not taken away the plaintiff who comes to court still has to prove that he has performed his part of the contract and he has been ready and willing to go ahead and complete the transaction so section then the section 16c has explanations there are two explanations to section 16c so it not only failure to prove there is an explanation one which is only for section class c section 16 class c where a contract involves the payment of money it is not essential for the plaintiff to actually tender to the defendant or to deposit in the court any money except when so directed by the court so we popularly as lawyers we use the phraseology jingle coins before the court you need not jingle the coins before the court you need not show the actual money before the court it is enough if you plead that is explanation one explanation 2 is now amended explanation 2 like section 16c it says the plaintiff originally was aware and prove but now it says plaintiff must prove performance or readiness and willingness to perform the contract according to its true construction so section 16c explanation 2 in line with the amendment to section 16c says averment the now the focus and significance is not on the averment in the plaint but on proof so as i told you the fundamental rudiments of evidence law of evidence is without a pleading there is no proof therefore as lawyers we continue to plead readiness and willingness we, we are not probably distracted from the amendment made for failure to aver and prove being removed and substituted with failure to prove alone we continue to aver we continue to plead in the plain readiness and willingness in order to set a ground for leading evidence at trial and proving your claim so this is section 16c and 21 has been amended before coming to 20 i would take very minor amendment in section 21 so 20 is the most important amendment which is going to cause really serious changes in the way the courts are going to approach suits for specific performance so before that i will take you to section 21 Section twenty one is award of compensation. Section twenty one before the amendment, the power to award compensation in certain cases. In a suit for specific performance of a contract, the plaintiff may also claim compensation for its breach, in addition to such performance. So the words before the amendment was in addition or in substitution of. So the court had the power. to substitute the performance with compensation so but in line with the objects of the amendment which i at the risk of repetition and reiterating performance is the rule damages or compensation is the exception unlike the pre amendment position where damages was the rule performance was the exception so in line with this amendment section 21 has been amended removing the words in substitution of so now if there is a breach the court in addition to performance can also award compensation section 21 yet another one another amendment this very minor amendment section 25 25 where the arbitration act section 25 before the amendment covered arbitration act of 1940 but now that it is the 1963 enactment now that there has been an amendment 2018 and the new arbitration act in 1996 So this section 25 has been amended to read the provisions of this chapter that is chapter of relating to specific performance of contracts so chapter 2 as to contracts this provision of this chapter as to contracts shall apply to awards to which the arbitration and conciliation act 1996 act 26 of 1996 does not apply and to directions in a will or code is to execute a particular settlement so the words 1940 has been replaced with the new act 1996 then section 40 other amendment is only to section 40 which is outside the scope of specific performance it is dealing with injunctions 
if you see injunctions section 40 there is a new inclusion ha 41 sorry, 41 injunctions when refused an injunction cannot be granted in certain cases which the section sets out a to j there are various instances where a court cannot grant an injunction injunction has to be refused ha has been added in line again with the amendment which i will go, which i'm going to take you to a little later ha says if it would impede so an injunction cannot be granted if it would impede or delay the progress or completion of any infrastructure project or interfere with the continued provision of relevant facility related thereto or services being the subject matter of such project so here the courts are now dissuaded from granting an injunction in fact on the contrary the word uses cannot be granted injunction cannot be granted if it would impede or delay the infrastructure project or anything connected or related thereto this word infrastructure project where does it come from it is a new addition to the act section 20 capital a you see section 20 capital a like 14 capital a power to engage experts section 20 has been amended to include section 20 capital a special provisions relating to infrastructure projects so 20 capital a 20 capital b special courts are to be set up to deal with disputes arising out of or under the infrastructure project contracts so special courts 20c expeditious disposal of suits pertaining to infrastructure projects within a time period of 12 months and the maximum extension of six months in aggregate so a time bound machinery is now available for dealing with disputes related to infrastructure projects if this is now analyzed with the object of the act to invite foreign investors and industries from all over the globe do business with india we we have a very friendly atmosphere even if there are disputes we will give you a speedy remedy redressal will be very quick so these are the objects of section 20 a b c so any what are infrastructure projects you may ask me. infrastructure projects are defined as a separate schedule a new schedule is inserted after the act at the end of the act and it defines various projects which will come under the category of infrastructure projects if you see the schedule which is after section 44 it deals with categories like transport energy water sanitation communication social and commercial infrastructure where educational institutions are set up ports infrastructure are set up health infrastructure hospitals are set up telecommunication networks are set up towers are put up roads and bridges are constructed all these are infrastructure projects which are defined and it it looks like that it is an exhaustive schedule because the act specifically sets out a, a special provision 20a 20bc dealing with 20a infrastructure projects a schedule will list out various categories of projects which will qualify to be an infrastructure project therefore i won't say it is an illustrative illustrative list it is an exhaustive list therefore anything falling within the schedule is an infrastructure project and you can take advantage of sections 20 a b c so therefore 20 a b c in line with section 41 if you see now where infrastructure projects are concerned the court should be very slow in granting injunction in fact they should not grant injunction if it is going to defeat or delay the project itself this is in so far as section 20 a b c now coming to the most important amendment section 20 as you all know section 20 before the amendment I will take you quickly to section 20 what it mandated before 2018 now what section new 20 says discretion as to decreeing specific performance was the heading before amendment the courts had the discretion to decree a suit for specific performance we saw section 10 we saw section 11 it may in its discretion totally removed in line with that section 20 now discretion to decrease specific performance the entire section has been taken away from the act so the jurisdiction to decrease specific performance is discretionary that was the opening words of section 20 prior to amendment the court is not bound to grant such relief merely because it is lawful to do so but the discretion of the court is not arbitrary but sound and reasonable guided by judicial principles and capable of correction by a court of appeal the following are cases in which the court may properly exercise discretion 
not to decrease specific performance. So instances are set, were set out in old section 20 where the court should not grant specific performance. Use your discretion, dismiss the suit for specific performance. What are the instances? 20A, where the terms of the contract or the conduct of the parties at the time of entering into the contract or other circumstances under which the contract was entered into are such that the contract, though not voidable, gives the plaintiff an unfair advantage over the defendant. So the court in its discretion, if it feels the plaintiff will get an unfair advantage, it can dismiss the suit. We have all seen number of cases even up to the apex court because of rise of property prices, immovable property prices. Specific performance suits have been dismissed on that score because it gives the plaintiff an unfair advantage. Now this is now taken away from the very scheme of the specific relief act. Discretion is not enough. Number two, where the performance of the contract would involve some hardship on the defendant which he did not foresee, whereas its non-performance would involve no such hardship on the plaintiff. So this is the converse, where unfair advantage to the plaintiff, where undue hardship to the defendant. If the court feels the hardship with the defendant did not foresee, here again, the classic example is rise in property prices. The defendant thought property prices will be stable for three years, five years. But if the entire real estate market changed, it's going to prejudice the defendant. Court can dismiss the suit for specific performance. Then the third exception was where the defendant entered into a contract under circumstances which, though not rendering the contract voidable, makes it inequitable to enforce specific performance. So, court again, discretion of the court came into play. So, all these cases and illustrations where court can refuse specific performance by exercising its discretion are these cases where the court can use its discretionary power and dismiss the suit for specific performance. But now the entire section has been wiped off, knocked off the enactment and substituted with, rightly, if you say substituted with substituted performance. It has been substituted with the new section, substituted performance of contract. So this topic, this concept of substituted performance of contract is very new to the entire enactment. It is not a concept which is available under the old act or I would say even under the contract act. It is a march of law. Definitely a new concept which is going to say probably courts are going to spend enormous time interpreting section 20. They had been interpreting 16c and 20 even until that. Readiness and willingness, what whether plaintiff were ready and willing, all these phrases, limitation, what when to when she should approach court, discretion, all, all these were debated up to very recently. But now, in my opinion, section 20 is going to be the debate for the future. I would read section 20 in its entirety. Specific performance of contracts, etc. Substituted performance, sorry. Substituted performance of contracts without prejudice to the generality of the provisions contained in the Indian Contract Act and except as otherwise agreed upon by the parties where the contract is broken due to non-performance of promise by any party, the party who suffers breach shall have the option of substituted performance through a third party or by his own agency and recover the expenses and other costs actually incurred, spent or suffered by him from the party committing such breach. So here, what is contemplated is there must be an agreement. There must be a contract. Either of the parties should have breached the contract. That breach gives a new right, a birth, new right, birth right is born to a party aggrieved to have substituted performance of a contract. See, as we all know, specific performance of contract is both for movable and immovable properties. It does not limit itself only to immovable properties. The act covers the entire gamut of moved property as well as immobile property. Therefore, Section 20 again does not limit itself in its application to only movable or only immobile. So any contract, be it for movable property or removal property, now an extra option is available for an aggrieved party, substituted performance of a contract. I will give an example for movable properties. For example, Mr. Sivashan Mugam is based out of Mumbai. He is a dealer in cotton. I am based in Tirpur. So I want to buy 100 bales of cotton from Mr. Shivashan Mugam. So we enter into a contract. But Mr. Shivashan Mugam, for whatever reason, is unable to fulfill his 
but he does not supply me the 100 bales of water. So my earlier remedy was sue him for damages or sue him for specific performance. But now I have an option under new section 20 to buy it from X. I buy the 100 cotton bales from X and sue Sivashan Mugam for damages and recover the costs which I have incurred in that process. So this is the new section 20 substituted performance. So how does it work for immobile property? You may ask me, this is a little complicated when it comes to immobile property. It's not as simple as I gave an example for mobile property. Let us say there's a contract for sale of an immobile property in Adaya. So I am an interested buyer. Mr. A is the seller. We enter into a contract. A goes back on his word. He breaches the contract. He does not come forward to execute a sale deed in my favor. My remedy is claim damages, refund of advance, or sue him for specific performance. But now under new 20, I can put all these in the back seat, go and buy another property in Adaya. Probably in the same street, Gandhi Nagar, second street, another property comes for sale. More or less identical property. I am happy with that property. It, it satisfied my requirement. I go ahead and purchase the property. Then that means I have obtained substituted performance of the contract. Now what is my right? So I need not come to court. So I get my contract fulfilled without approaching the court. My right now is to sue A, the owner, for the costs or damages or losses which I have suffered because of the breach committed by him. Only for that purpose I come to court. I need not come to court and wait for a degree for specific performance for 15 years, 20 years. I identify another property, obtain substituted performance. Now stopping here for a moment, if you go back to section 16A, you see the amendment to 16A, it says specific performance of a contract cannot be enforced in favor of a person who has obtained substituted performance. So in principle is I can't have the cake and eat it. Say I wanted a property in Adair, I have purchased the property. So therefore my object is fulfilled. My remedy is substituted performance is now eclipsing the original sale agreement. The original agreement or contract with the owner A get eclipsed. And my right is now limited to recovery of damages or compensation. So that is why section 16A is amended in line with section 20 to say that specific performance of a contract cannot be enforced in favor of a person who has obtained specific performance of a contract under section 20. Then if you come back again to section 10 also, these are exceptions to section Section 10, specific performance of a contract shall be enforced by the court subject to provisions contained in subsections 2, 11, subsection 2 of 11, section 14 and section 16. So section 14 is the second exception. Section 14, again, if you see, first class relates to subject to performance. Following contracts cannot be specifically enforced. So as I told you, 14 is dealing with the contract. 16 deals with the person, party to the contract. 14A now says the following contracts cannot be specifically enforced, namely Clause A, where a party to the contract has obtained substituted performance of a contract in accordance with Section 20. So I must choose to elect. Doctrine of election comes into play here. If I choose to get substituted performance of the contract, I cannot enforce the original contract. I have to give up my right under the original contract. Only then I can have the contract Substitute performed by, sub, by substitution. Now section 20, we'll go back to section 20. Section 20, if you say 2, it's a subsection, subsection 2 to section 20. The first section we saw, we can have substituted performance, recover the costs incurred or spent or suffered from the party committing breach. So your options get dwindled down to recovery of money alone. Number 2, subsection 2. No substituted performance of contract under subsection 1 shall be undertaken unless the party who suffers breach has given a notice in writing of not less than 30 days to the party in breach calling upon him to perform the contract within such time as specified in the notice and on his refusal or failure to do so, he may get the same performed by a third party or by his own agency. So this is giving a fair opportunity to the party committing breach. So it is mandatory before opting for substituted performance to give a notice. There's a statutory notice now contemplated under section 22 of not less than 30 days, a notice in writing 
calling upon the party in breach to come forward to perform the original agreement so if we does not do it in spite of the notice in spite of the period you mentioned notice not being not less than 30 days you can go and perform it outside by your own agency or with a third party and come back to 21 and so for costs incurred and anything suffered on account of the breach committed by the other party and the proviso proviso is important as i told you you can't have the cake and eat it the proviso exactly says that provided that the party who suffers such breach brief breach shall not be entitled to recover the expenses and costs under subsection 1 unless he has got the contract performed through a third party or by his agency the question of compensation or loss arises only if you get the contract performed so you cannot say i am going to buy another property that will not amount to substituted performance what amounts to substituted performance is the performance of the contract should be completed i must buy the 100 bales of cotton or i must buy another property as substituted performance of the original agreement for sale or the original contract only then i can invoke section 21 and claim recovery of damages for breach from the party committing the breach then 24 nothing in this section shall prevent the party who has suffered breach of contract from claiming compensation from the party in breach so in addition to the actual costs you have suffered because 21 if you see again it only says you can have the option of substituted performance to third party and recover expenses and costs incurred so this talks about only the actual loss you suffer 24 enables you to claim compensation also in addition to what costs you are entitled to under section 20 or 21 nothing in this section shall prevent the party who has suffered breach of contract from claiming compensation from the party in breach so therefore 20 is going to be the future section 20 is enabling a plaintiff to get a decree even without filing a suit he virtually gets a decree even without coming to court he satisfies himself his contract gets fulfilled by substituted performance he come he comes leisurely to court only to recover costs and compensation so the entire delay factor the time factor costs involved the question of escalation of property prices all these can be knocked off the plaintiff without coming to court gets relief and he has the luxury of fighting litigation to only recover the losses and costs from the defendant this is going to have very serious ramifications there are no judgments as on date under section 20 in fact, in fact before in fact i have before i ventured to even write the handbook i looked up many many number of books before the amendment section 20 discretion discretion alone will run to 200 pages any book if you take section 16 and section 20 will occupy at least 300 to 400 pages of any textbook on specific performance but now the discretion the entire 400 pages is taken away from the book what remains is a new concept substituted performance and infrastructure projects which is again going to be a game changer and if you one more additional which is not related to the amendment there is no amendment with regard to the principle of time being the essence of contract as we all know it is a time tested principle that in so far as immovable properties are concerned the presumption is time is not the essence of contract that is well recognized principle by various courts up to the honorable supreme court but in 2011 the supreme court started doubting this principle whether this presumption of time not being the essence of a contract in cases of immovable property sale of immovable property they wanted to have a relook in a separate case which in fact charla manikandapur was the earliest in 2011 where the supreme court said we have to have a relook revisit this principle of time not being the essence but they found that property prices are fluctuating so much even within a span of five six years the supreme court said very inequitable for a person to enter into an agreement and fight a legal battle for a decade we all know a specific performance suit may invariably land up in a first appeal or a second appeal before the high court or the honorable supreme court by that process of at least 10 to 15 years is lost so supreme court in charla manikandapan's case and again one or two judgments later on they said definitely this concept has to be revisited it is not no longer equitable to say that time is not the essence. Even in the contract for removed property, we should hold that time is the essence. 
and this is in line with the amendment why i am saying this is because the amendment brought out in 2018 is to fast track they want to give speedy remedy to litigants without delaying matters special courts for infrastructure projects one year time the entire matter has to be disposed of therefore these are the laudable objects which which the act has been amended so in line with the amendment is what the supreme court said please don't treat agreement for sale for removal property as time not being the essence these cases also you must see that time is the essence if a plaintiff comes court belatedly he should be disentitled don't say time is not the essence therefore he can come at the fag end of three year limitation and file a suit so this again is going to be revisited by the courts because of the amendments in fact i would like to quote the just is call in fact is forward here very beautifully summed up in two sentences the moorings and desires of business and economic activities have changed much in the past 60 years he talks about the amendment in 2018 and now we are perched at the dawn of another watershed moment very beautifully worded by just sanjay kishan call and that is exactly what we are facing A new era in specific performance litigation it's going to be a game changer i think as part of the lecture and i'm prepared to answer any doubts or questions you may have i can then over to ashok and shoshan thank you balaji thanks for thank you om sir thank you wonderful analysis of the amendments in a very crisp manner you have given us the essentials of the amendments which has come up i think there are one or two persons who have raised their hands sure uh, chitra narayan yes and yeah. vishri khan can i ask yes yes chitra very very meticulous presentation balaji thank you thank you so much um so i have about i think three questions yes questions so first is uh, do you not think that uh, section 20 of the specific relief act would have been better placed in the contract act because it uh, uh, requires an examination of substantive rights of parties under the contract so that is one second is um, uh, should the uh, should uh, the issue of determinable contracts and the way it has been interpreted by the courts now also not have been considered because the position as it stands now is that all contracts are determinable correct and so uh, if it is determinable then where is the there is no specific performance yes yeah. uh, so these were uh, my questions so i'll stop it to yeah. yes i think as you rightly said it should have been placed in the contract act section 20 is having very substantial change to the way the act is going to be looked at therefore it would it would have been better because the parent act is the contract act i think i agree with you but right or wrong it has been brought in under the specific relief act so therefore probably as lawyers i think we should we should be taking things as it is laid down before the table and uh, yes the determinable contract has always intrigued me because any contract as you said is determinable so a person can easily get away saying that this contract is determinable it can't be specifically performed this has not been touched by the amendment so this also should have been touched maybe we should probably make recommendations as lawyers for these amendments to be brought in, in near future thank you thank you thank you balaji uh, may i invite mr srikant uh, it was a wonderful session uh, i mean i don't want to repeat i feel really that balaji should have been in the law commission as a member <laughs> because my question which it's not my question it's a, it's a thought for everyone's thought that uh, it's exactly to balaji section 20 as you said is a laudable provision but you as a regular practitioner in this branch of law uh, is there not a fiction that a person approaching the court for damages on a substituted contract and what is the assurance that apart from the notice which issues about the breach committed by the other party a person committing breach can still come to 21 and ask for damages so where is the presumption that by simple notice the other party has committed breach one the second one is the breach which you are alleging on the other person is subject to proof it is not that all the suits filed under section 20 in future by the amend in, the, in terms of the amended act have to be decreed so where are we heading for now Uh, is it not is it not a fiction which the law has created definitely like, definitely i agree with you definitely it is going to be a gray area as you rightly said ah. even service of notice 
mandated under section 20 may be disputed by the defendant exactly exactly so he may say i will never submit notice if i had known and exactly. have performed exactly so therefore so that is again and and and, and the question of breach again is subject to proof so therefore it is going to divert the entire I litigation to a different uh, territory altogether exactly. it is definitely going to probably end up more in more litigation also possibly exactly but and i also heard you saying that uh, though you intended purchasing a ex property in adiyar however you had specific performance by purchasing another property i think determined substituted, substituted performance substituted performance exactly as we are uh, ma ma madam chitra was telling see when it is determinable either it should be determinable or the law should cater when it is not determinable it is not either way so by a notice you say mean even a defaulting party we do not know the person issuing notice might be the person who had breached see it's a contract we are talking just because Correct. the person who comes to the court no presumption that the other party had breached so but this notice the presumption is brought giving cause of action for a person to file a suit on the basis of the notice and non performance between the days prescribed true, true. probably what what i feel the mistake committed here is probably this substituted performance should have been placed under infrastructure projects exactly if that exactly. had been done i yeah. think the object would have been achieved exactly not so interest is catering to any any contract by removing yeah. section 20 in toto yes. is going to cause a very serious hardship so exactly and my point okay. is that by virtue of issuing a notice you are presuming that the other party has breached a breach ah where is the presumption again it is subject to proof proof so anyway that is a, i think that is an anomaly and a fiction is going to be very big anomaly thank you thank you thank you for your wonderful uh, in depth analysis and uh, had you been in the law commission this anomaly would have not arisen abra abra enna titirpinga anyway nice of you thank you thank you thank you thank you srikant yeah. uh, may invite mr soumya narayan yes. this wonderful analysis of the lead part regarding the infrastructure one i think it is no more or equity i think so if we think so equity will break it sir your question no more equitable remedy i think so no more equitable nu solla mudiyadhu no discretion discretion the act itself on the was founded on equitable principles so in fact yeah. i would say i would say other end of equity you, you person who is aggrieved will be given relief the words you shall the other extreme of equity but no but what i am telling is even as he court shall degree the specific suit yes, yes. even if it is a fag end of the 3 years time correct correct this i think it's not a reasonable one so i said this may shall on the is going to have a very serious ramifications i have to I, see how how courts are going to view the amendments so there are not many judgments on the amendment the amendment provisions yet so we have to wait and see Yeah, yeah, it's a square. Wide scope or interpretation. As one of the says, you should be in law commission. I wish more than that in a drafting committee. <laughs> well done, well done, Balaji. Thank you. I am leaving that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, sorry, I'm not going to be there. I don't find any other hand raise options being exercised. So I take it that. There, there are no more questions or if anybody wants to yeah we come to an end almost i invite mr shivashan mugam to give a vote of thanks for the session the outset i have to thank balaji for readily accepting our invitation to give us this wonderful lecture you are uh, really enlightened with your uh, fast tracking the entire amendments and uh, bringing us to uh, with your update knowledge and i hope to disturb you once again on your uh, new book <laughs> about the rent control act and i thank you uh, thanks the all participants for joining us and uh, thank the balaji and others thank you thank you thank you thank you very much balaji thanks for thank you thank you thank you om sir thank you so much